Hello and welcome to ELT Under the Covers teaching methodology series. In this episode, we're doing a deep dive into community language learning, CLL. Let's check it out. Community language learning, otherwise known as CLL, is a teaching methodology developed in the 1970s by a priest stroke psychologist stroke educator, Charles Curran. Drawing on principles of counseling therapy espoused by Carl Rogers in his person-centered therapy, CLL emphasizes the importance of the learners themselves and lets them uh, design the lesson content, which means that CLL has no predetermined lesson objectives at all. The teacher plays a supporting role as a counselor while the learners are just encouraged to work together, interacting and helping each other in a supportive community. Because of its counseling links, it's often described as counseling learning. In its pure form, how it works is one, the learners sit in a circle with an audio recorder in the center and the teacher stroke counselor stays on the outside of the circle. Two, learners start a conversation in their native language and it's recorded for later use. Three, the counselor stroke teacher provides translations and explanations to support the learners. Four, learners repeat this new language as accurately as they can. And five, there's further reflection and analysis of the new language. The recorded dialogue is often transcribed and put on the board by the teacher. Community language learning. We're going to do a deep dive, but first, introductions. <laughs> I'm Neil, a team teacher. Hello everybody, it's Professor Rich. I think a lot of people think about community language learning and think that it's very similar or the most similar of the three methods to com uh, communicative language teaching that we mm. do today, where the focus is on this kind of fluency-based authentic interaction between students mm -hmm. and the teacher becomes more of a facilitator. And I, I very much think that community language learning is where this ideas come from about student-centric teaching Mm -hmm. or student centric language learning where the teacher is in the is kind of in the background and the students are doing stuff and the teacher is a facilitator and then we get these criticisms of teachers who are too teacher centric and all that stuff right mm -hmm. and from that comes teacher talking time and all the rest of it yeah um one of the things sorry go on yeah no i, I was i was just going to add on to that and i think <laughs> One of the things that I noticed when I was kind of doing research and reading up about this, um, I, I do have uh, somewhat of a background with counseling. I was studying to be a counselor at one point in my life, specifically the humanistic approach, which was Carl Rogers. Was, so I was pleasantly surprised when I was like, oh, this is kind of based around that. And the, this idea of student-centered approach, we it still, I like the community language learning because it, it seems to be that you're just treating the person as a whole, you're, uh, as a whole person. It's, uh, they call it whole person therapy in that you're, you're, you're meeting this whole person. You're not just dictating the language to them. You're kind of um, building a relationship with them and going, well, where do you want to kind of go with, with this? What do you want to say? And I'm going to help you say that. Uh, or uh, help you express that um, and it, it was I see a lot of counseling in there and I, I'm not surprised at all when it's talked about as in counseling learning and a lot of counseling is learning in a way because you're you're learning about yourself so it's interesting here that we've got something that's extrinsic that they're learning but they're learning it through themselves it's almost kind of like you're being uh, that parent and you know that the kid needs to learn to speak English or they need to learn math or they need to learn to just not you know, control their emotions even and you're just kind of guiding them along and nudging 
nudging them, perhaps in a way that you think will um, help them uh, or not help them, give them the space, the opportunity to experience something that will uh, enable growth, uh, I feel. It's a difficult, I find it difficult to put in words, but... Well, that's yeah. what that's what facilitation is supposed to be, isn't it? Yeah. That's what teacher as facilitator is supposed to be. Yeah. Now, that element of it, I think, yeah, you can get really deep with it. And probably in some ways, you know uh, a lot more about this with your counselling and your experience as a parent and your experiments with that in terms of how you're kind of, you know... Uh, encouraging your son to learn without just giving giving him the answer and stuff. I mean, all mm -hmm. teachers should do that a little bit, but uh, here it's even more hands off. Mm -hmm. I think one of the questions that pops into my head, this is kind of changing the subject a little bit, <clears throat> is it's about, and we've talked about this before, at some point they talk about how the teacher kind of feeds in language. Mm. Now, I know how I would do that, but I know some other people who don't like the idea of the teacher interrupting the authenticity of communication mm -hmm. as well is another thing that people might say about it. So what do we know about that, about the kind of pure community language learning? How does this feeding in happen? Well, <clears throat> in the purest form, it should be the students basically decide they go start start a, just you just start a conversation in their their native language and then the the teacher would do the translation and then we would kind of like feed that feed that back to them uh in english and you know they would practice it that way so it's kind of it's derived from authentic student interaction but there, you could see obvious holes in that, especially if you've got, you know, like um, some of the clips that I showed there, there was pairs, <laughs> people in pairs. So what if people talk about things different and, you know, they, they got on different topics. So I think there kind of has to be in a pragmatic world, uh, a balance. So maybe they just, you know, for your first class, you do introductions, but, you know, like maybe later on, you kind of all have to agree on a theme that they want to talk about today. But I think that should that's generally done in conjunction with students and teachers. So, you know, the student just uh, the teacher doesn't just go, OK, now today we're going to talk about um, I don't know, calling customer service or something like that. Um, that it would be something like, well, what do you want to talk about today? And someone might say, I want to talk about going to the zoo. And another person might say, well, I really want to talk about buying hardware at Home Depot. Um, and then they go, well, no, we don't want to do either of those. And they all come to an agreement mm -hmm. as a community. That that what makes sense to me. Um, we, we do have uh, an example um, of community language learning. Um, we we don't there was it's very difficult to find them uh on the old tinternet um but this one um was one of the better ones and this one is actually they're learning spanish so i think we could kind of get a better idea of how it works because you know we're native english speakers and we kind of have a little bit of a background in spanish good morning Hi. how are you guys doing today pretty good how are you? doing really good Me pone un cerveza ahora. <laughs> 
I feel like we're going to see some differences between Latin American Spanish and continental European Spanish here. Kind of awkward, but good day or not, um, for all of you we've seen that before, haven't we? That sort of uh, nobody overly stressed out thing. We've seen it in a few of the things that we've watched. I don't know if I've ever said something like that to my students, but I just think it's a completely useless thing to say. It, and, it is. Um, I mean, because what are you going to do? How are you going to resolve that? You're gonna suggest, yeah, I'm particularly stressed today. Uh, you know, my my cat shaved off all its fur. <laughs> Mm. Well, what 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 are they going to do? Does she have a, like a bag of edibles or something like that? She's going, here, take one of these. I've got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? If she's got, if she's offering something, that's one thing. But then just offer it. You know, like if you look at a student and they seem stressed out, just be like, all right, it's not an exam. It's okay. It's just we're just having a conversation. Mistakes are good. Oh, mistakes are good. Mistakes are fine. Mistakes are okay. People, everybody makes mistakes. You know, sometimes maybe they just need some reassurance or they need to understand something. Well, like if you're teaching Japanese students, you really do need to emphasize the fact that everything they say doesn't have to be perfectly correct. And in fact, there's no such thing as perfectly correct with, when it comes to language. That That's perfect, Rich. And, you know, that's, I was, I was going to say something similar in that, you know, if they are stressed out, the, the only thing that you can really do, uh, especially when you think of it from a counseling perspective, is to just um, acknowledge and accept the emotion. You're stressed. That's okay. It's okay to be stressed. Mm. It's a stressful environment. Mm. This is what, and then what you do is you say, "This is what. This is what's going to happen next," and you give mm. assurance that you know, like you try to allay fears and give assurance that, oh yeah, it's not going to be, um, you know, so bad or whatever. Um, that's a terrible way of putting it. Uh, and then let them let them in on the plan. You know, this is what we're going to do. This is step by step. So often anxiety comes from fear in the future of the unknown. So, you know, kind of letting them in on what you're going to be do, how the process works, um, helps that subside but you literally cannot control other people's emotions um so yeah i'll tell you what though well yeah i mean your message was not just about controlling other people's emotions but it was about people accepting their own emotions right yeah that's the two parts is uh, uh right. having people acknowledge that uh, everyone acknowledge that stress is stress uh and you accept don't accept that you're don't accept that you're stressed per se in that you know like you oh i have to be i have to accept that i'm stressed uh but just accept that it is what it is you know what i mean um mm. it, it, it is there acknowledge it yeah and you know we'll we'll we will <clears throat> work around it we'll deal with it um but here's what's going to happen so you know maybe yeah. you've got a better understanding going forward some sometimes i feel like we don't have enough words and language to correctly talk about this kind of stuff and also it's overly complicated by the fact that a lot of things are subjective what is stress how do you measure it and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. because one of the conversations i've been having recently with students i do a lot of presentation coaching mm -hmm. and a lot of people subscribe to the purveying advice to be confident and i would actually say that a, a, really a lot of people including people who give presentations they actually they say that that's the advice be confident mm -hmm. you know and i've always taken the perspective of embrace your nervousness mm -hmm. if you are nervous and you have to give a presentation you know just embrace it as much as you can because actually the most excited you will ever be giving a presentation is doing one when you're nervous and then it goes well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it was like when I did my first live stream, I was nervous about it and it went well and it was amazing. I felt great, mm -hmm. right? Now I do them and I don't feel nervous and neither do I get incredibly excited about it, you know? Yeah. So... I think the, there's something to be said for embracing that nervousness because I think it can add a certain kind of special energy to things. 
But a lot of people then seem to think that that means like, oh, be nervous. But it's not be nervous. It doesn't mean go on stage and, yeah, and whatever. And they probably have images in their head of people who've given terrible presentations because they were nervous, which, you know, that's true. That can happen. But also, like you're saying, I think there has to be an acceptance of it. You can't just be confident. What does that mean? Well, you can try and fake it a bit. There's a, you I, can't... Th I think the way I, the way I see it, um, there's, there's a, there's a good book about on this. Um, um, the title is actually <laughs> basically the, the, the nugget of gold It's uh, by Susan Jeffers. It's called feel the fear and do it anyway. And I, that's basically what it is. It's a, a, except you're stressed, except you're nervous and just do it. <laughs> it's not, right. gonna, it, it doesn't change anything. Uh, yeah. you know, if, if it goes bad, it goes bad. If it goes good, it mm -hmm. goes good. You still do it though. Yeah. And, do it to the the best as you can but you know don't you know try to uh hide or you know like um remove any other emotion you can't it's it is what it is so you just kind of go through the process yeah that's my perspective yeah um so yeah I don't know where she was going with that. I think maybe she's just kind of the the, the niceties, uh, but maybe she's building yeah. into that because I did I did actually quite enjoy the transition that she did there of like close the door. Oh, sorry, please close the door. Um, I thought that was a mm. very easy way to contextualize what she was going to talk about. But yeah. I don't know if you noticed she did introduce mm. the teaching point. It was not derived from the students. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was th that I was actually going through my head. Well, maybe this is a slightly more modern take on CLL, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's have a look. Today is about to get better because I have here, in honor of Hillary's birthday, we have this delicious cake. And it's Always great to bribe students. Yeah, I'll get you to the cake. <laughs> <laughs> See, 
going to um, look at the sentences phrase by phrase, and we're going to figure out what the translation is. All right? Do you remember? Podría tener un pedazo de pastel. How about podría tener? Do you remember what you asked in English, Gordy? Yep, it's very close. Um, can I have? And to make it very polite, we said, um, could I have? And so I'm going to put here the English underneath. Could I have? All right. <laughs> yeah, got un pedazo. And then that's right, you said a big piece. So I'm going to add in the word. Grande. I just had a piece of cake, but it was a big piece. So I added the word grande. So what would un pedazo grande? What would that mean, class? A big piece. A big piece. All right. Then say pastel. Okay. Yep. And there we go. We're talking about cake. And then you guys probably have heard this one other than this class before. Por favor. Please, that's right. Good job, guys. All right, this is the other one we have. All right. So we have, si, te daré un pedazo de pastel. How about, si, te daré, remember what you said? Uh, yes, I'll give you a big picture. Yep, so we have, yes, I will give. Yes, I will give, and then you said, I will give you, right? So you want to go, I will give you. And then you guys know this one, right? Un pedazo de pastel. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about te gustaría? Um, you were always asking a question. Both the gustaría and both ría kind of like I That's a good observation. It's a really good observation. They're both on um, the ia, making it a polite request form, just like conjugating the verb. So te gustaría. Um, do any of you remember uh, what? Uh, what she was asking. Um, it's got a piece of cake in there. Yeah, but that little, um, but that little thing was so grand that time the end. I I think I asked my if she would like a piece of cake. Yeah. So what would te gustaría be? So would you like a piece of cake? Yup. Yup. I'm just gonna put would you like. And then I'm going to put just dot, dot, dot. We already know how to, how to do a, what's that word at the end? Oh, that's right, come man. Glad you noticed that one, Hillary. What do you guys think come bien would mean, knowing that she already asked, somebody else already has a piece of cake, so now she's asking if someone would like one? Yep, two. Two or as well. Two as well, also. That's also is a good translation for it. Let's put also, because that's very all right, and then in response, si, sí, me gustaría. Yes, I would. Yep, you got the <coughs> point. And so you guys probably also recognize me, which is similar to me or I. It's a good one to point out. I'm just going to put yes, I would. And then we have this one, look how we recognize. Te gustaría un pedazo también. Would you like a piece? Yep. Also? Yep, because we got pastel. Yep. <coughs> and since they figured out that pedazo is piece. So would you like a piece also? And then si gracias, that was. Yes, thank you. There we go. All right, so good job with that, guys. I'm going to read the entire. Um, dialogue to or should say conversation in Spanish real quick. I'm going to do it twice. I want you first to just listen to me saying it. Next, I want you to close your eyes while I'm saying it. But first, keep your eyes open, reading it as I say it. 
podría tener un pedazo de pastel, por favor? Sí, te daré un pedazo de pastel. ¿Te gustaría un pedazo de pastel grande también? Sí, me gustaría. ¿Te gustaría un pedazo también? Sí, gracias. Right, I'm going to read it one more time. This time I want you guys to close your eyes and think about the conversation. Think about who was saying what as we did it. ¿Podría tener un pedazo de pastel, por favor? Sí, te daré un pedazo de pastel. ¿Te gustaría un pedazo de pastel grande también? Sí, me gustaría. ¿Te gustaría un pedazo también? Sí, gracias. All right, guys, so for our last activity, what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to play the role of a human computer. All right, so you guys, there's a couple words I know you have a little trouble pronouncing. I want you guys to um, point to a word up on uh, in Spanish, and then you're going, to, I'm going to say it for you, and you repeat after me. And you can do that as many times until you feel comfortable with the pronunciation. All right, so go right at it. I'll wait till you guys are ready. So, this one here, the dazzle. The dazzle. You know, it, it was top heavy at the beginning and kind of clunky, a little bit awkward. And I think it was just because she was introdu introducing the whole concept. But mm. um, I feel like if this was just used every time, she wouldn't have to keep explaining. You know, it, it would have been a little bit more streamlined. Um, I'm not sure how... <laughs> I like the realia. Uh, I'm not sure how affordable uh, that would be or... Generally, in a language speaking class, I found it not great to have students with things in their mouth uh, while they're also trying to speak. <laughs> but um, yeah. I, it kind of lends it to that because they were able to have the cake and like listen to the uh, the recordings as they ate the cake. And I thought, oh, okay, mm. okay. Mm. But um, I, I I did like it. I liked that it were. Uh, the, the back end where the, uh, the the students were being mined for that that material they, they they everything was authentic they produced it she she translated it and um, then they kind of just reviewed and went over it um, I, I, I did like the whole practice close your eyes practice try to remember back to the conversation that you were having when you're when you're when that's when she's you know uh, reading out the the text and stuff because i feel like it it just keeps tying it back to them it's like stitching it uh to previous memories and i i, I feel like that's kind of like that 
um, what is it like the web of learning or what, what whatever it is where you're constantly if you've learned something new you want to tie it to something that you already knew or you know if you've got you want to start a new habit then add it on to an old habit um, in, in it, and it builds in that way I liked I very much liked that approach and you could see um, the the students towards the end they were getting pretty engaged you know that guy made a good observation about the R and then he shared that with the class and she was like yeah it's a good observation everyone else comes like mm, yeah okay and you could see that they were thinking about it um, and you know I could I could see a lot of positives with that I could I could also see a lot of disadvantages or negatives uh, especially the translation you'd have to be really strong with your your second language to be able to do that right well I'll tell you what I'll pick it up there uh -huh. so translation I don't know if that's how they speak Latin American Spanish maybe they do but I've never heard a Valencian say podría tener in yeah. fact I used to say it when I first went over there and they said I used to go that. to the supermarket. Well, they always looked at me funny. And then I asked someone and they said, Oh no, no one would ever say that. <clears throat> That's like saying, uh, may I have permission, you know, to, uh, to, to have two bags. It's yeah. like, you're asking for, you're not the understanding asking, you're was not actually... the understanding. My understanding was it was like, it was asking kind of like a, a, a philosophical question, like, can I can is I have possible? a is it possible yeah. in this universe to have a yeah. bag? <laughs> so that's 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 also yeah. it could it could it could either be that <clears throat> or it could be, you know, a sort of a, a permission thing. <clears throat> but um it should be a polite request, which in Spanish is Me das dos bolsas, por favor. Uh and I'm not sure what you were saying for cake, like un big pectado or something. Pas of pa cake. Pastel, pastel. Was oh, de pastel. Yeah. yeah, but she said like un pedado de pastel, right? Uh, oh, yeah, I think it, in in Spain they sent us they sent to say trozo. I think un trozo, uh, but but I that could easily just be a difference. So, okay, so that was a bit odd. So then that leads into your thing. Like, I mean, her Spanish seemed pretty good, mm -hmm. so maybe it's just you know the Spanish has m a wider variety than English. We might say. English is more standardized. Spanish has different varieties, which are very different. Did you know in Costa Costa Rican Spanish, they and that's the correct one, they don't they don't roll their R's at the end. Blasphemy. So, <laughs> so they and in the middle. So they don't they don't say pero, they say pero. Really, they say pero. Like wow. I couldn't believe it. I've got a Costa Rican student and she was like, no, 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 we say pero, pe, we say pero. Pero, and I'm like, what? <laughs> that sounds that sounds like me when I got off the plane in Spain uh, in 2008. So that was that was kind of funny. Uh, but anyway, okay. So moving on, translation. You're right. That is a limitation. First of all, this is not at all what I thought community language learning was actually. So I'm not. I wonder how how perfect an example this is because, as you said, it's very difficult to come up with it, to find the examples of yeah. CLL in practice. Yeah. So I don't know for certain if this is um, a paradigmatic example or not, but anyway, it's not what I expected. Mm -hmm. So just very, very, some like outline of it, but the general concept of what I expect. In fact, that kind of clip we saw in the intro of like the, you know, sort of the East Asian teacher and the students, was it Thailand or something? Maybe. Indonesia, yeah. um, whatever it was, like that looked a bit more like it to me. So anyway, okay. So at the start, uh, I didn't really like her instructions. Now that's me as an English teacher who teaches people who can't speak English. So obviously my instructions are going to be a pretty pretty different to that because yeah. she was saying, okay, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to do this and then we're going to do that. And then you're going to ask me this question and blah, blah, blah. you know, and I was just thinking like, oh God, I would never like explain something like that, you know, um, as, as an English, as an English language teacher, we kind of learned to say like, okay, so first you'll have a conversation and I'll start, you know, but okay, maybe she doesn't need to do that because they're yeah, major English you do the speakers. Graded instructions. Yeah. Uh, I think what it is with those instructions and why she went in 
to so much uh, depth was um, with the with CLL. There's that idea of the uh, Crashens monitor theory, the uh, effective filter hypothesis. So the idea being is if you let people in on the process and go through it step by step. It, it allows them to relax because they're not having to think about what's coming next because they they know they it's pulling back the curtain so they could go oh okay so this is this is what to expect and in, in psychology the idea is if you know what to expect you feel more relaxed it, I like that part of it yeah I like that part of it that that's what I would call signposting yeah. to some extent yeah. I like that part of it. It's just that I found her explanation a little bit verbose. Yeah. Which, but okay. And maybe I'm being overly critical there. She didn't do any ICQs, but all right, whatever. But being this, not. But they're natives. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but it's, yeah, but, yeah, but even yeah, I, know, natives, I know, I know, yeah. Yeah, people I, tune I realized people as soon as I said it, I was like, yeah, <laughs> native speak. I, I do it with my yeah. kid all the time. I, do. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you, if you realize that, you know, but for me, being a community language teacher, I kind of go around now and I see natives communicating with each other sometimes, giving instructions. And I'm like, oh, you're opening up a can of worms there that someone could easily misunderstand that and this could happen. And, you know, you start to actually realize that, you know, we do actually learn skills being teachers, you know. Yeah, there's a lot, lot of soft is, skills. Mm, yeah, one of them is giving concise instructions. So, okay, moving on from that, because it's kind of overly critical, really, anyway. So then um, what now, you were talking about one of the positives and you were talking about, like working with this conversation and closing their eyes and imagining it and all this kind of stuff. So for me, this is a, a type of activity that in my head I call conversation patterns. I don't know what, mm -hmm. I don't know what it's actually called. That might be what it's actually called. Uh, I really got to grips with this in Japan uh, because the place where I taught in Japan, they didn't have any resources. They just have a whiteboard and they have lesson plans and that's it. There's no, there's no, there's no printouts or whatever. So they really liked working with these conversation patterns in Japan. And I really like conversation patterns. Actually, I think they can be very powerful, mm -hmm. especially for this kind of pair work. And they're actually surprisingly adaptable because your initial thought with the conversation pattern is, oh, I'm just learning this whole conversation word for word. But what you start to learn is how to take bits out and put other bits in, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe we started off with, could I have a piece of cake? And then it changes into, you know, could I have a pen please? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I've only got a piece of it, whatever. You know, it starts to become much more flexible mm -hmm. and it can it can lead into freer speaking actually. Mm -hmm. And that's one of, the, one of my, like I have this in my head and I, you know, I'd love to do this more actually, but I, obviously I don't at the moment, I'm not currently teaching groups, but uh, one of the, one of the final classes I taught in Vietnam was about language for agreeing and disagreeing. I had this uh, conversation pattern about, uh, you know, it just starts off with like expressing your opinion in a kind of an outrageous way. It's like, you know what? Uh, um, I think, and then there was like a list of like radical things that uh you could kind of you could kind of say that you think like one of them was i think donald trump is batman <laughs> <laughs> what do you reckon to that you know and the other person has to Brilliant stay there. i'm sorry i don't agree with that whatsoever right and it was batman. i don't agree with that whatsoever because yeah. And then they had to give their own free reason. And then the other person, ah, it just yeah. the, the, the remainder of the conversation pattern just said, disagree, reason. And you just kept going then until you got to, you know, all right, I can't, I don't know what else to say, you win kind of thing. So, and it was every time the idea was to use like a different chunk of language for disagreeing, mm -hmm. you know, and these were all language chunks that we practiced. But the top part was a full, was a was a like more of a solid conversation pattern. I can't actually remember how it went, but there was a conversation pattern in there. And I do think they're good to work with because you get revision, revision, revision of the same language, and you get that sort of phrasal pronunciation that's often missing in things. That's one of the things that I really liked about this, how everything was phrasal. And she really focused that as well. When she was translating De Gustaria, she was saying like, oh, that means, would you like, you know, would you like dot, dot, dot. That kind of stuff was, was great because anything that gets people away from this word to word 
type of thinking and translation that people kind of naturally fall into. I myself fell into it. I think pretty much anyone falls into it without realizing that it's a terrible way to learn language is, is word for word. Yeah. And languages don't even work like that. Uh, our, our brain certainly doesn't work like that. So that part of it I really liked. Conversation patterns I really liked. Mm. There's so many things you can do with them, like you say, closing your eyes and imagining what it was and trying to run through it again. What does it mean? And working with the translation in that way is also very possible. So that's, well, that's the thing I loved. Actually, before I move on to my next point, what do you have any other things you want to talk about with conversation patterns? No, I, um, I just want to re reiterate with the closing your eyes and listening to the conversation and trying to imagine the conversation, it was, I, I really liked it mostly because um, it was tied to something that had already happened that they had produced. So they had a memory, it was tied back to that memory that was the most important point for me. Not that it was a conversation pattern. It was the fact that it was a conversation pattern that they produced, that they have a memory for, um, that was being reinforced mm. and built upon. So it's, it's mm. foundational uh, learnings. But, you know, you, you keep building upon the same thing yeah. again and again and again. And the more you yeah. tie it back to memories or things that you've encountered previously, the, the, the deeper the groove yeah. becomes. Yeah, I completely agree. That's that's personalization, isn't it? And yeah. I think, yeah, when it, most of the time when I would do conversation patterns, there'd be some sort of comprehension based activity that would lead into some sort of vocabulary work. And then the, the conversation pattern emerges from that. Now, this is really interesting because this is one of the things about CLL that what it is, is they produce it in their own native tongue. And then yeah. that's where the conversation pattern comes yeah. from. Like you say, that can they can then link it back to an authentic experience. So that's that's kind of good. But now, also, also do you know, like the, the, the opposite side would be instead of them listening to that conversation um, that they've done and try to imagine them try to imagine or recollect uh, or bring back that memory uh the opposite way would be sometimes i see is that the teacher would create a new conversation pattern um and they would say oh, okay now close your eyes and imagine this new conversation and that's the difference that new conversation i don't think is as good because then then that's that's two things that they have to do they have to imagine this new scenario they have to engage with yeah. this new uh conversation pattern even if it's you know a little bit different you know they've mixed out a couple of right. words it's not it's, theirs it's not theirs as well so that's why i keep yeah. reinforcing that it's you, you it's going back it, in comedy it's like a callback humor you know, uh, you make that joke early at the start of the step and then you weird, you weave it back into a new joke mm. that you've made and it ties it together and it makes a bigger impact. Mm. I know I'm hopping on about that, but yeah, please, let's, let's no, no, move on. That's a, yeah, that's <laughs> So the next thing I wanted to say is I think that it took a, quite a long time to get to the punchline there. And I would expect, yeah. I, I, I felt... It's kind of funny because, you know, I, I often sort of defend teachers against TTT. But in this case, I think TTT was the thing on my, I even hate the expression TTT, but I think the teacher Itty. talk was. The, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> while I die. I, it's because I'm drinking Coke and it gives me uh, phlegm. Anyway. In this case, I think there's a there's a point to be made that she was talking a lot mm -hmm. and the students didn't. And all we mm -hmm. got was at the end, a little bit of text, which is like, yo, now the students do loads of talking, dog. And it's like, well, do, maybe. I mean, oh, we do actually see. see <laughs> yeah, we see that a lot, don't we, on these videos? And you kind of say, well, do they maybe? Hmm? I'd like to. Yeah, I would like to see it because I'd like to see whether they actually can have the conversation without looking up at the pattern, because that's, that's the other thing with conversation patterns. What you do is you, you cover them more and more as you yeah. go through. So um, what I used to do is I'd have the board rubber and as people were role playing through the conversations, I'd start rubbing out words. Right. Uh, and then when I use this later, the British council, and we've got the interactive whiteboards, then you can do fancier stuff with it where it kind of slowly disappears and stuff like that. Yeah. 
but that's the idea isn't it that you can start you start to walk without the crutches yeah, and i would love to see how she kind of monitors it if she gives corrections um mm. if she makes notes on corrections if she records them when they do these little conversations mm. also these conversations are really short so you know i don't know does that mean that she has the the pairs rotate because you know there's only <laughs> so many times that they can say you know me gustaría también or something like that you know it's it's very short punchy conversation i wouldn't even say it's a conversation it's like a, a minimal interaction uh so you know i want to see how she puts that into practice and i want to see free practice i mean for myself i'd be like okay a large group that's great just go around everyone asking each other who wants cake and all that sort of stuff you know um so it's a missed opportunity when we don't see uh the freer practice of these because it's it's almost like these these teachers think that the freer practice part is there's nothing to really for other teachers to drive and learn from where it's actually one of the most important points is you know how you run your activities mm. Yeah. Well, also, it's not just that, but as an observer, you always want to see evidence that the students have done, have actually learned something. Yeah. And we didn't see that in that segment. Everything could have just been her pulling teeth. Yeah. So we want to see the students doing the work. And that's what I meant by it seemed to be actually too teacher centric which is weird isn't it because i was expecting yeah. this, this that's what i said by i think cll i thought yeah i thought cll was going to be like super well that's what it's supposedly one of the uh disadvantages of this is that the the counselor stroke teacher could be too non-directive and the students often need directions yeah. so you know like, oh, Okay, so I, I think we're here. here we're de here we de we're dealing with sort of a pseudo CLL, right? Where she's like a teacher who's using some some community language learning, perhaps. But anyway, okay. So the recording, I think, it's worth talking about that. Okay, that's cool, isn't it? I mm -hmm. want to do more with recordings. I've actually just started um, really doing heavy recording work myself in my classes, mm -hmm. and I'm still kind of at the moment. It's almost a little bit. Uh, Learn and dirt, learn. It's not really, really. No, it's not at all. No. What it, what it, what it is at the moment is I'm kind of recording the students and giving them a couple of tasks to do with the recording and sort of being like, so how did that work for you? <laughs> so I don't really know exactly what I'm doing with recordings yet, but I'm playing around with them in a bit. I've always had it on my mind to play around with them. I've played around with them before. I've done prescribed activities with recordings for lesson plans here and there. Um, but, uh, I think there's, I think there's a lot that can be done with them and I want to, I want to sort of work with them more. And I think there's something very beneficial for students to hear themselves speaking, especially in other language, even in your own language, it's kind of beneficial because you hear it and you're like, what, that's what I sound like. And then you get used to it. And, um, and they tend to have that reaction actually in the other language. Oh my God, it sounds so bad or, or, or whatever, you know, yeah. and it's really good because, so far, the experience I've had is there might be things that I've been saying to students over and over and over and over again, like, um, you know, oh, you need to start like connecting your speech together and start speaking like, hello, I want to go to the shops, right? Or, you know, you need to, for example, you need to speak speak a little bit faster. Some people just go silent and I don't know if they finished a lot, especially sort of East Asians, you know, they 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 kind of say something and then there's this silence and i'm like mm -hmm. is another thought coming or is this the end of the you know and th you know the thing is i'm keep trying to convince them of this you know you, you often feel like that don't you as a teacher that you're constantly trying to convince your students of some issue that they have you're like no no th this is something that you might want to work on yeah. and then you show them the recording and they're like oh yeah so i noticed that my <laughs> yeah phrasal pronunciation is not very good or i noticed that i leave big gaps and yeah. there's no you know and it's like hmm really <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's um that's been a really a really good use and the other the other the other side of it is that they hear themselves speak and realize that they actually can do it oh i gave a presentation in english amazing and i think that's 
more what these people had because they were sort of beginner learners of Spanish. So they were hearing themselves actually produce sentences in Spanish on the third day of a Spanish course from, I assume, from nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's nice. That's kind of similar to, I guess, the experience that, you know, we had with Michelle Thomas and things like that. Yeah. I remember certainly when I was doing like audio linguistic stuff, I was amazed that I was able to say like, necesito esto por favor or something you know yeah. um and you know yeah it, it is it is good but the the fact they've got the recording and it actually the, i love the fact that the conversation gets pieced together yeah i, I thought that, that was be... really smart uh, i like mm. the way that she did it you know where she's um they say it, it they say it in english she comes in does a translation then does the translation again and very very smartly chunks it so they don't she doesn't just get them to repeat that whole sentence you know she she depthly navigates okay this part uh mm. um podria tener and then they repeat and then next part whatever and then it, it kind of all builds together um i thought that was that was really well done in a really fast way i think that well that that's one of the issues that i had with recording and using that uh, in class is that it felt like I, I it was more of a time sink for me you know like a lot of preparation mm. and that was a really good example of using recordings with not much preparation yeah um it's a good point especially yeah. in a group class isn't it yeah you, you'd have to have a real big think about how recording takes place and there's all kinds of issues as well especially if it's like teenagers recording each other and stuff you don't know what they're going to get up to. But it was really effective how she utilized it as well. You know, gets to listen back, get them, gets them to listen back to it, listen back to it, um, imagine it, um, listen back, board it, go through all the language, mm. listen it to it again. So it gets reused uh, again and again and again. There's got a lot of exposure and it's all uh, student produced authentic uh, material. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I really I really liked that. And um, yeah, I think it it added more engagement to it. Uh, definitely. So just going back to the issue about the teacher talk time, I think one of the mm -hmm. places where this was highlighted for me, actually, was that there was a place in the class where she was talking and talking and talking loads loads it was around about the time she was putting the conversation pattern together and then she she like i think she just finished and she stopped and she suddenly was like expecting them to say stuff or to give her stuff right mm -hmm. and she just kind of went silent she was like looking at them right and like someone said something and she said oh yeah blah 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 blah, and then she did it again mm -hmm. and there was silence for ages and i felt like the students wanted to say something but this classroom environment had been established where it was the teacher mm. classroom, you know, and you can it, kind of feel it, it. feel. it did feel like that they were waiting for the teacher to do something, which is counter to what I really thought CLL was. Well, I think that is, that is actually one of the reasons, one of the rationales for being critical of TTT is that it creates an environment where the students feel uncomfortable speaking because it's like, the teacher's the default speaker and the students sit there and mm -hmm. listen, right? As tradition, as per traditional classroom. Mm -hmm. So that might be a criticism of her rather than the method, but nevertheless, we, I think we it's, definitely um, I think there, it's, it's implementation. It's uh, I think for, <clears throat> for me with CLL, it has a lot of, uh, you need to be very confident as a teacher to be able to pull it off almost kind of like in a, in a dogma way, because it, it, it is kind of dogma, dogma, I can't remember the pronunciation in the, you know, in the, um, May. you go in with no materials and that they are created during the class and you've got to have the wherewithal to pivot and mm. to build on what you are given by the students and she came in with a plan uh and i feel like when you're doing the cll you you don't co you don't go in with a plan you go in with mm. what do you want to what do you want to talk about today and you know you 
come up to a collective agreement of what it is that you want to cover and they say well let's just have conversation and build from there so it's giving the students a trust to not just be like i want to talk about this and it be completely out there and none of the other students want to talk about it so yeah yeah i think that's the other thing that i would like to see actually because this was as you mentioned about the realia this was very directed with the here's a cake and it's her birthday and oh you know it, i mean it, was, it wasn't prescribed it was but it was what 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 you might think of as being kind of Mm, synthetic or like very di <laughs> directed student produced but very direct student produced so that's kind of it's kind of a shame that we had the cake <clears throat> because i want to see this students come in sit down and i mean you could just do nothing but i think what i you know I'd, I'd be quite happy to put a photo on the board or something and be like right Okay, so what what are you going to say about that? Just, you know, and do exactly the same process, but they're talking about that. So four, you can have four people together. You don't have to have pairs, do you? So mm -hmm. you've got the four people having a conversation. They might say, oh, well, his head looks a bit weird. You know, me parece que tiene un pelo muy raro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, brilliant. You know, that would be, a, I, I, would, I would be quite excited about that. And then, then taking the conversation pattern of that and working with that, you know, even just thinking about that is kind of making me think, oh, that's interesting, you know. Well, I, I would of... I would even say no picture. I would just be interested to <laughs> go in and be like, okay, this is because you've got to imagine that these so when we when we teach students, it's it's not often that we get these random bunch of groups that are like some sort of mind your language classroom where everyone comes from a different walk of life no we'll we'll get like summer camps are all kids around the same age we'll get uh university students so yeah they might have different interests but they're all going to university of the same age generation they, mm. they've got similar approaches to life there's similar life situations things going on what's important for them to communicate what they want to talk about in uh, another language mm. and mm. I feel like if you introduce something you you don't let the students really talk about what they want to be able to communicate in a different language mm. so I'd love to I'd love to have a class where uh, and do CLL where they you just go what is it you want to communicate and talk about in English mm. and then yeah. let them decide uh, you know uh, you know, a couple of minutes uh, <laughs> talking your talking your native language, and let me know some themes yeah. that you want to talk about, or we could we could cover them today, or cover them later on in the course, whatever you want to do, and get a consensus, a community consensus from them, and then go. All right, well, let's go with this today. Uh, yeah, I feel like you've been reading about dogma, <laughs> <laughs> which well, I guess will be. I, we'll, I we'll would do that. that. I would do point. that now. But if you you yeah. asked uh, Neil, you know, like ten years ago to do something like that, I would be like, uh, uh, but I got nothing prepared. <laughs> uh, for just, <laughs> I just, I would shit my pants. I would shit yeah. my pants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely an advanced style thing to be doing, isn't it? I think you do need experience to do that stuff as well. I think that, that I mean, when we do get onto dogma, that's one of the things that people say about it, isn't it? That it is something that needs a, a certain degree of being a teacher before you can... I would say this is more difficult than dogma because you have that added, added element of <clears throat> having to have a high level of another language to do the translation. Yeah, well, that's just a skill, isn't it? I mean, I guess. Oh, well, I guess you could say teaching is teaching is breaking down into skills as well. But yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, because you know, like if you were gonna, if I, you were going to do community language learning, you need to know another language. <laughs> I mean, uh, this, mm. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. how how else are you going to teach this? 
you could no. take part, parts from from this which is what you know uh, communicative language teaching did you know this idea of mm. lower the effective filter um the idea mm. of trying to get students to produce their own you know like a language and communication but you know mm. to do it in its purest form you need to be fluent in another language mm. yeah 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 i believe so uh, or you have google translate at hand yeah so maybe in the future there will be technology that we can use to um aid us you know to do community language learning with you know some sort of ai translation or something like that but then again if technology is at that level where we can do translation <laughs> in real time uh, and it's pretty accurate then what's the point in doing cll anyway you know i don't know neil i'm I think that's that's a conversation for another day, isn't it? It is, yeah. How will translation affect language learning, language teaching and stuff like that? It does see it seems like opinions very wild on it as well, very wildly on where it's going and what's gonna happen. But anyway. Yeah, and you know, it's that was that was one of the problems as well with translation and I don't think she was latino latina um so there might have been other stuff that's missed out you know like um you know she says tambien and she's like oh well that could be too also as well we don't really know what is culturally more appropriate you know because a lot of the times when we we talk about oh oh my other half you know um we say my other half in english but, you know, in Spanish, what you say, media naranja, you know, like my half an orange. So, you know, like there's these colloquialisms, these, when, it gets, when it gets more idiomatic, how, how will translations work? How will that work in community uh, language learning? Because then that starts to go into personality and how you kind of, uh, poetry even and how you express yourself you know your her translation might not be your translation of how you would put something yeah but right so we're getting a, that's going we're digging really really deep here. <laughs> well it's just it's just an issue with translation in general isn't it and languages and flexibility of language that's true um did you, did you ever hear about the guy there was a fellow who translated i don't know if it was war and peace or he he, <clears throat> he translated a really long russian novel and um, it's about 150 pages shorter than the original. <laughs> and he said it's a better version. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, that, yeah. that was the whole problem. That's the whole problem with um, people talk about with the Bible, because it was originally what in like uh, Hebrew, it got translated mm. into Greek, then into Latin, and then at some mm. point into Arabic, then into German, then into English. Mm. And, you know, a, mm. uh, a little, a slight meaning, a uh, slight change in meaning from one of the translations can mm. mean something quite different <laughs> mm. and can then affect people's entire oh, yeah. belief systems. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah no, totally. <laughs> funnily, funnily enough, I've been reading a little bit about this recently. And, um, you know, it's it's really interesting, the, the going back to the Hebrew stuff, because we have... Obviously, they kind of try to piece that together by looking at the the kind of the Jewish religious texts and the Old Testament because they actually vary, but you can see lines that have been taken from the same source and things like that, right? Yeah. Because they're supposed to be from the same source, and um, one of the one of the weird things about Hebrew is um, that it's a language which it doesn't like the the it doesn't put all the letters that come out your mouth kind of thing in, in terms of modern languages yeah like they miss a lot of the sort of i suppose vowel sounds mm -hmm. and so like you know like they talk about one one of the names of god there's many names of god and one of the names of god is this is this y h v h right <clears throat> y h v h uh -huh. which uh now gets translated as jehovah right 
Is it but, like Yawa? I, I... Well, no, that was the, the Greek that was the Greek translation, yeah. The Greek translation was Yahweh. Yahweh, right? yeah, that was it, right? Yeah. Yahweh. And they actually said, like the, the, the Greeks actually, that well, no, they say today that probably the Greek translation is more, is closer to what the original Hebrew was because they were probably, you know, closer language, the closer sounding languages than, right. than any of our languages today. So it probably was similar to Yahweh. But people, people say Jehovah. I mean, you know, that, that certainly that the certainly Jewish people and Christian people tend to think that the name of God is 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 pronounced Jehovah. This is this Y H V H. Yeah. Right. So um <clears throat> yeah, there's all kinds of weird stuff like that with it. And like you say, I mean, you start to dissect these things and some of these sentences, you know, they'll say stuff like be still and know that I am God or something like that, right? Yeah. And you think, well, in English, that can be interpreted a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And if you take into the account that it's been translated like 10 times, you're like, okay, now, but the original sentence might be something like, you know, um, I feel happy and relaxed today. You know what I mean? It could, it could be anything. Yeah, oh, God, yeah. I like, feel happy and relaxed today. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, tranquila, you know, like, uh, is being like peaceful, but peace uh you know like means relaxed right but it could also mean uh you might read it and go oh that means peaceful to be at peace mm. but you know do, are, are you being there's a difference between being at peace and being relaxed or being chill or and also mm. there's it's more for me it's the idiomatic stuff um and what is literal and what is figurative like for example when i think about the bible um on, and other kind of these religious texts that there's always something talking about um a great flood and i was and people always read into well what is the meaning behind this and now mm. it seems to be actually a lich there was at some point a literal flood <laughs> mm. where that that took over the world i don't know if there was someone out there that actually put two of two animals on a big ark but um you know it it starts to mix of well what are we is it literal are they being figurative are they being Id idiomatic and all these have been mm -hmm. translated include politics in there include you know uh teacher uh teacher talk time where they take their own interpretation and their directive and prescriptive and you're like Wah. so yeah um one of the things as well i think with community language learning uh, with the translation it's going to be interesting seeing how it relates to what we're going to also look i know you mentioned dogma but we're also going to look at audio uh lingual method the army method the uh, and the grammar translation method as well Ooh. because they do that right Ooh. i'm getting excited <laughs> you should be excited it's yeah. it's you know you, one of the things that we don't often talk about, and we will talk about more when we start looking at ancient methods of teaching language, is... You mean pre-grammar translation? Well, well, you know, grammar translation was basically what it was. Uh, that, well, to, that, to... Was, that was the, the, the kind of um, 1900s, wasn't it, grammar translation? Yeah, yeah but, you know, mm. we don't really know kind of like how they did it in in the past uh Ooh. we could kind of get some ideas you know like the, with the way that they they taught other things like um yeah. you know is it was it aristotle that was no it's socrates that does the dialogic uh learning he he was big into That's that right. right lots That's lots true. of discussion it's, it's plato, plato actually was it plato pro pro probably socrates was as well yeah because we don't actually have any writings of socrates they were all burnt in the in the in the at Alexandria uh, library, yeah. So they were they were all burnt, but Plato loved writing dialogues, and the main character was always Socrates. So a lot of the things that we guess about Socrates, we think that Plato is representing his teacher's beliefs in the correct way, basically. So we think that Plato's character of Socrates was like Socrates. So yeah. what what? Uh, what the point that I was 
getting to was <clears throat> that if they, because they would obviously have been learning other languages as well. Well, actually, that's not that obvious. But um, one of the things would be like, well, what method would they use? That you know, if mm. Plato is learning another language or teaching another language, he's probably going to be using the method that he thinks works well. So the dialogic mm. learning, the discussion, and that would sound. I feel an awful lot like community language learning because there's kind of like a lot of discussion with that, right? There's a lot of, mm. you know, he would maybe feed dialogue to people and, you know, be like, oh, yeah. I'll translate this. This is what people would say. Oh, mm. I don't know. I think that it would probably be very specialist, very specific and very individual. And um, we probably have the kind of situation we get now where, some people discover or customize their own method, which is just brilliant. And other people just go in the wrong direction for years and years and years and don't really realize it. So, you know, we're going to get our Chris, what's that fella called? The guy we interviewed with the beard. He went to China, learned Chinese. The beard. Yeah, Chris, the Chris guy. Oh, Chris, Chris Lonsdale. <laughs> Chris Lonsdale. Yeah. It's the beard. So, it's the beard. It's like, why am I focused on the beard? <laughs> he had a bit of a beard when we spoke to him, did he? Yeah. So, yeah, it's like Chris, it, you're going to get the Chris Lonsdales who essentially do it all off their own back and then read the material and realize, oh, there's actually lots of academic rationale for what I'm doing. Whereas in that case, they're not going to have the academic rationale because language learning will be so niche and so specific that yeah. it's not widespread enough for it to be studied and understood. And I think people would just do things their own way, really. But obviously, you're right. There will be people who will be able to speak other languages because, you know, when you wade in and destroy the local tribe or whatever and then conquer them and do whatever, then you need to be able to communicate to them. Uh, to some extent, they probably just expect them to learn Greek or whatever, but they probably would have some 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 people learning languages yeah so you're yeah. right and it would be interesting and who knows and you might you might be right maybe it would be sort of dialogic and communicative and who knows? I, we don't know and um yeah so we we have this this series ongoing where we've looked at the kind of classical 1970s uh, methodologies of silent way suggestopedia um community language learning so check out the others uh, of that uh, go through our playlists on our YouTube channel and we've got others coming we're going to look at the, the ancient methodologies that we just kind of briefly talked about and eventually we'll be going more modern um, but what basically we need you to do is to for us to keep doing this we need you to subscribe we need you to like and to share Sure. And please leave a comment. Um, what are your mm. thoughts? If you're looking for more information uh, from myself, uh, you can go to teamteacherchina.com. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of materials, PowerPoints that you can use instantly in the classroom. We've got a Team Teacher China YouTube channel where we have videos teaching you how to use those uh, materials. Team Teacher English where we put those materials into a, a video form for self-study. And Team Teacher Baby where I take my experience as a teacher and put that into parenting. And go to YouTube.com slash Professor Rich to see some English teaching you can catch me weekly live streams on oxford online english youtube channel oh and also you can you can do a youtube search for pog space uk and you would get my alpha version of my new gaming channel which actually just have some trial content on there at the moment you can email us here at elt under the covers of gmail.com if you have anything you'd like to contribute to the show smash that like button share and subscribe and, and watch 100 of the video and don't exactly. click off thank you <laughs> bye